Welcome to Lessons from the Playroom. In this podcast, Lisa Dion will help you explore the little things that make a big difference in play therapy. Lisa is the founder and CEO of the Play Therapy Institute of Colorado and the creator of Synergetic Play Therapy. You know, sometimes therapists get all caught up trying to study big theories and mastering techniques to help children like me. But sometimes it's the little things we show you along the way that make the biggest difference. Join Lisa as she teaches you some of the little lessons that children are trying to communicate to you so that you can help us in the best ways possible. And on behalf of all the kids you work with, thanks for listening and believing in us. Let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the latest episode from the Lessons from the Playroom podcast and webinar series. Really excited that you are joining me today for this episode. This is episode number 32, and the topic today is teletherapy. How do we do teletherapy with the play therapy population? And really what we're going to be getting into is what is teletherapy Is it even possible to be able to offer therapeutic services to a child, to an adult, to their parents through a platform such as a computer or some other platform where the client isn't sitting directly in front of you? You're not actually able to touch them, play with them directly in your office or in whatever setting that you typically see your kiddos in. That's really the big question on the table, and I think it's an important one for us to talk about because teletherapy is becoming more and more popular. It's becoming more and more widely used. So let's have a discussion about the pros and the cons, why you would, why you wouldn't, uh, maybe just some different things to think about in case you are considering using teletherapy in your practice, or maybe you already are, can offer you a couple more ideas about how to expand that or deepen that experience for yourself and for your for your clients. So let's go ahead and dive in. Let's talk about teletherapy and what it is. So it's referred to with some other uh, terminology. So sometimes it's called telemental therapy. That may be a new one for some of you. The one that's most commonly recognized is virtual therapy. Telepsychiatry, and obviously that's psychiatry through the the medium and platform that we're discussing, and then um, telebehavioral health, which is where practitioners who focus on behavioral interventions that they use teletherapy to support that uh, development with their their clients. So, but basically in a nutshell, that's really the the definition that I was able to come up with that seemed most widely used was. Treatment in which the source of the therapeutic agent is at a distance. So I'll say that again. Treatment in which the source of the therapeutic agent is at a distance. So basically we're talking about distance therapy, typically through the use of a computer or some kind of technology platform is really what we are discussing. Now the need for um, teletherapy really came about with the really just a lot of people in rural areas just not having access to mental health services, even supervisors not having, you know, clinicians not having access to supervision, uh, parents not having access to parenting support. And this isn't just in the mental health field too. This is also through the medical profession. So teletherapy is is pretty well used throughout the medical field. So doctors being able to get on the computer with their clients to explain whether it was medical results or to talk them through various things that they might be, um, you know, trying to heal. Again, psychiatry is using this. So it's being used across multiple, let's put them in medical and mental health fields and and really the, the the new question is play therapy and all the research that I was doing and looking into this I mean there's quite a bit out there on how to do this with adults there's even quite a bit on how to do it with uh, kiddos but not so much talking about in a play therapy context so I'm really excited in this episode to talk a bit about the use of it in a play therapy in a play therapy context but 
It really came about because there was a need to access more mental health in areas where there just, it didn't exist, right? There wasn't a play therapist in the community. There wasn't a psychiatrist in the community. There wasn't a just mental health practitioner in the community that specialized in whatever it was that the, the client was needing. So that's really what prompted the use of using this medium to be able to provide these different services. One of the things that I want to say in this episode is um, I'm not for or against using teletherapy. I do use it, but I don't use it in every situation, which I'm going to share with you. I think that there are some situations where it's really useful and other situations where we need to take things into consideration. So I don't really have a bias for or against. In this episode, I want to just really create conversation and present more about How might we think about it if we were to consider it? What are some of the limitations? And again, just what are some of the things to think about? Depending on where you are in the world, it's really important that you look into, are there any rules that govern your ability to even do teletherapy? So insurance companies, for example, may or may not... um, pay for, may or may not approve of teletherapy. So you might want to look into that depending on if you use insurance or your agency uses insurance. Sometimes there's also licensing barriers. So like in the States, sometimes there's some States allow for, let's call it like cross state therapeutic services and others, you have to be have a license in the state in which you're providing the service, which means that clinicians may have to provide or might need to hold multiple licenses in various states. And so there are different things to consider depending on where you are in the world. Obviously, I'm more familiar with what's going on in the U.S. So I would really encourage you if you're looking into this to call whoever you need to call to start to understand, is this even possible? If it is possible, are there barriers? What might you need to do to make sure that you're doing this in a legal way and in a way that, um, you know, that isn't going against any license that you're holding or or any kind of limitations that, that, uh, that you may have to just work around. So I would just really encourage you to look at that before, before just going, yes, I would love to do this. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some pros. Let's talk about some cons. And then, of course, I'll share some stories, as I like to do in these podcasts to bring this to life for you. So so there are pros and cons on both the therapist side and on the client side. So obviously some pros on the therapist side are less travel for you. Um, if you want to be able to work with clients that are global, let's say, you have access to clients all over the world. If you have a calling to be able to provide services in a more rural part of the world, teletherapy can be a great platform and way to be able to provide those services. And, and there is, you can do it from the comfort of your office, from your home. So there is um, some flexibility. There is some comfort. You don't have to get in a car and drive. And what I would say is some of those same benefits are for our clients as well. So again, if our clients don't have access to somebody, or maybe there is somebody in their community that they do have access to, but they want you. You know, they they want your expertise because they perceive that you have something really valuable to offer them. They they don't have to feel limited to who is available in their community. They could do they they have the ability to access services that feel really congruent for them. So that's definitely one of the the pros for them. Obviously, they don't have to get in the car and drive. All of those same type of um, pros. One of the big pros with kids has to do with the technology itself. There are a lot of children who, simply because it's through a computer, actually feel very engaged in the process. The technology platform is a platform that's actually really uh, familiar to them. They like it. They think it's really cool. And so um, 
I would encourage you not to make assumptions about the platform itself. There are some kids where, again, using the technology is actually spot on for them in terms of how they interact and what's really meaningful. So uh, don't don't just write the write the platform itself off. Uh, it can be really, really, really valuable for a lot of kiddos. Um, some of the cons that I have found in my own experience and in my research, I mean, obviously we need to look at, when we're talking about children, the age of the child. So a two-year-old is not going to probably do teletherapy unless the parent is in the room and you're more focused on working with the parent and guiding the interaction between the parent and the child. Sometimes the child may be struggling through something where they just need more support. They need the, the, the experience of somebody in their physical presence. So you may want to look at the, the issue itself that the child is trying to work through to determine if this is a, um, this is a good platform or not. Um, also, one of the other cons is for a child that is not technology driven, this platform may feel really, really challenging for them and that you may have a really hard time with engagement. So those are just some things to, to consider. So let's dive into the really fun stuff, which is putting this together. What does this look like? What are, how could we actually make this work? So let's start with adults. So I mentioned that I do teletherapy. I do a lot of work also with adults, not just with children. And I have a global practice. I would say that the majority of the adults that I work with, I use teletherapy with the adults that I work with. And that is everything from, you know, traditional, more traditional types of therapy issues that an adult may, may bring to business coaching to parenting. Teletherapy is an awesome, in my opinion, platform for providing parenting support. Sometimes you can even offer it real time. So the you're having a session, it's in their home, you can hear what's happening in the background, you can do real time with the parents, walking them through, talking them through different things that might be helpful, but you really can engage the parent through the through the computer. The tricky part is again where you start to move into working with the kiddos and the kiddos start to go down in age. So oftentimes you may have to do some some various modifications. So because um, for those of you that know me and know this podcast and know my slant on how to work with people and I'm constantly taking the nervous system into account and I'm looking at the, the brain, the, the biggest barrier, no matter what the age is that you're going to face, in my opinion, has to do with your ability to regulate the client. And so let's be honest, is it, you know, is it the most ideal scenario? Probably not. Um, but is it better than nothing? Yes. Is it better than the phone? Yes. Any platform where you can get more access to the client's nonverbals is going to be is going to help you as the clinician. So when you're doing teletherapy and you have your video on, you can see them. You can pick up on their nonverbals. You can hear them, which again is different than the phone where you can't see them. And then obviously if you can't work with them at all. The thing that you're going to have to work around is that, and this may sound really, really strange, is that when you're working, let's say with a parent, you're typically only looking at half of their body. So you're pretty much looking from the screen up. So you do miss out on the things like watching their toes tap on the floor. And because you may have a parent that's actually highly anxious, but just looking at them through the computer, they don't look it because the upper part of their body is very still, but the lower part of their body is, you know, tapping away and you're missing out on some of the data from their nonverbal cues. So when I am doing teletherapy with my adults or with the parents, and I will get to the kids, I promise, um, I am encouraging them to move, to breathe, to stand up. 
So I am bringing in some directive pieces to help them modulate what is happening while we're going through our session. I may even ask questions like, as we're talking about something, describe to me what's happening in your body so that I can get a little bit more information about what's going on in their in their not I mean in within their bodies so that I can monitor that a bit more. I may say something like, you know, I would describe to you what's going on with your feet. Are they tapping? Are they not tapping? Um, sometimes you can't see their hands because their hands are below the screen. So anything that you can do to really enter their their world, recognizing that you are missing out on nonverbals, is going to help guide you. And from there, you can pretty well do whatever you would have typically done with the parent in front of you. Now, you may have to modify some experiential exercises, but you can still role play back and forth. You can still talk through various scenarios. Uh, what I've even found, and this is going to maybe sound, uh, I don't know how this will sound, is I've even found that because the computer is, there's, there's this recognition that it is a little bit harder, what I find is that sometimes there's even more of an effort to connect. It, they actually, the session become, can become even more meaningful because the client has to stay engaged more just to be able to be engaged through the computer. But it does take the therapist to have a heightened sense of attunement and a heightened sense of presence if you're going to facilitate them through the computer because you are missing some of those nonverbals. Now, when you're working with the kiddos, you definitely need parental support. So you're going to need the parent, unless you're working with a teen and they're pretty savvy on their own, you're going to need the parent, obviously, to put the setup together. So I would encourage you to have sessions with the parents if you're going to work with younger kids, just like you would, you would do the intake. And then I would encourage you with the parent to actually set up the play space to have a discussion, what does this look like? So they may, um, I want you to think about an in-home therapy type of a setting. So you may have the parents get certain toys, put them in maybe a storage bin, and then at the time of the sessions, the parent is responsible for creating the space. Maybe the child can help if the child wants to help, so setting the toys out. If there's a sand tray, if you're gonna be doing some art, if you're going to be doing um, an activity and materials are needed, then obviously you need to speak with the parent, the guardian, and make sure that they have those provided at the time. So they need to set that uh, that that piece up. I would encourage them to set it up and to you know help the child log in and make sure technology is flowing, and then the parent can either step out of the room. Or if you are facilitating a parent-child interaction or session, then you would just you know take it from there. And you may have to do things like, could you adjust the camera? Those are things that you have to do. And there's also something really real about the whole experience of, hey, we're working together to try to make this happen, knowing that you know we can't actually be together in the room. So... The younger the child, you're probably going to need to have the parent in the room. And, and that would be the case anyway, even if you were working with the parent and the child directly in your presence. And you're probably going to need to have a bit more of a directive type of a, of a process if you're going to be doing teletherapy with, um, with children, guiding them through more focused activities just for some of that containment. But you could very easily uh, do a sand tray session with a child over teletherapy as an example. You can guide them. You can have the, the camera pointed in a way where you can see the child and what they're creating in the tray. You know, you can facilitate the tray just like you would if the tray was, was right there. Same thing, you could facilitate them through an art experience. You can even have the child... Um, you know, actually play and have them play in front of the in front of the of the camera, so that you can be engaging with them, just like as if you were in the room. 
my, I'm going to throw this out here. If you're like, oh, this is interesting. I hadn't thought about this or I've never done this before. It may feel awkward. My suggestion is to try it. So grab one of your colleague friends and, and practice with each other. Set it up. Pretend that you're going to facilitate a session so that you can actually feel what it feels like to be on the side of the computer that is doing the therapeutic, you know, being the therapist, and then also what does it feel like as the client so that you can get a sense of how you might want to modify, how you might want to change things up. Um, so I hope in what I'm saying here, you're getting the sense of this. It's not something that you need to be afraid of. It, you can be really creative with it. There, there are some things you're going to have to modify. You're going to have to engage the parents to help you out a bit more because you don't just have the room that you can both walk into. Um, you know, you can do awesome work with parent child interaction type of um, play. You can facilitate just as you would facilitate. And you also have to keep things in mind. You have, do have to keep the child's age in mind. You know, you do have to keep the issue that the child is working on in mind. You do have to modify when needed. And as I mentioned, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't have a bias if it's like super awesome or, you know, don't, don't do it at all. I think that it can be really amazing in some contexts. And I think in some contexts, it's not the, it's probably not the most um, appropriate intervention. And in those, um, in those types of scenarios, you can always do awesome just parenting work. You can always just focus on the parent. So if you're, for example, working with a child or a family in a rural community and the child, let's say, has a disability of some kind and, and is not able to engage over the computer, it's, it's too much work with the parent. You can do so much great work just working with the parent. Help them understand what's going on with their child. Help them with um, parental support. Give them books to read where you can talk them, talk, talk through the different material until there is the opportunity to, and then here would be the last part that I would propose, is that when you're working with the, the, the child in a teletherapy experience, set up time where at some point you do have face-to-face. -face. So I have had experiences where families will fly out um, and be with me for a week or two and we have sessions in person and that's how we start so that there is that sense of connection we do establish that rapport and then they go home and then we can continue the teletherapy but we already have that connection in place and then you know if needed they can come back almost like little intensives or if you need to start teletherapy you know, doing teletherapy, that there's a plan for them to come see you, or if the family can afford it, that they fly you out there and you can do some in-home for that connection, for that uh, establishment of um, being able to engage and deepen the relationship a bit more. So again, think outside of the box, get really creative, recognize that you have the ability to access um, a global clientele in, in if that is something that you would love to do, and you have the ability for clients who wouldn't normally be able to receive your services to also be able to interact with you. And does it replace you know, the brilliance of the one-on-one? -on -one? Absolutely not. Um, is it an alternative to consider? Sure. And keep in mind that with anything, there's always the pros and the cons. So I hope something from this episode just got you thinking, got you curious about how to do it. And I encourage you to give it a shot. Try it out. Practice with somebody. See if it feels like you. Um, and you'll know, for those of you that have listened to me and studied with me, I'm going to say that the most important thing is for you to find modalities and find ways of doing therapy that are most congruent for you. So if you try it and you're like, this is not for me, then it is not for you. If you try it and you love it and you find out that um, it's a really cool way of offering support to people, then go for it, embrace it, and have a heck of a lot of fun with it. Play therapist wherever you are in the world. 
be well, take care of yourselves. You are the most important toy in the playroom. Until next time.